All right, Gary Brecka, people know you as a longevity guy, mm-hmm. as a you know biological age kind of guy, but you're mm-hmm. also pretty jacked and you're pretty good at you know staying lean and you've got some good advice there. Like what mm-hmm. would you say your key sort of golden rules are for for staying lean or, or getting lean, losing fat? Um, wow. Uh, I would say my golden rules are consistency. Um, you know, I, fat is burned slowly over time, not intensely in short periods. And so for me, it's about having just a consistent uh, routine every day. And if you saw my routine, I, I, I am, I mean, I probably won't be able to hold a candle to you. I mean, we, we're, we're going to work out after this and I'm going to be probably face down on your gym floor and you'll be like, this guy's a biohacker. Um, <laughs> and you'll be like, I'm on my 50th pull up. But, um, you know, it's, it's consistency over time. You know, I, I, I do do steady state cardio every, every morning and I, and I, and I also do weight training, you know, minimum of four, four times a week. But I think that when we look at how the, some of the, some of the laws of how the body, you know, burns energy, glucose first, glycogen next, fats, you know, last kind of in that order and that intensity matters, you know, for burning fat um, and, and nutrition matters for burning fat. You know, one of two things that I've seen that have had dramatic impact in when I went, when we're trying to take the masses and get them to lose fat. And that is um, we borrow Tim Ferriss's uh, 30, 30, 30, 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking, followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardiovascular exercise, which he deserves a credit for. He wrote about it in the four hour body. Um, and be, because most people before they start out on a fat loss routine don't have any data. Right, so they don't know if they're hypoglycemic, they don't know if they're hyperglycemic, which I think those two can be treated very differently. Um, we talked about that as in terms of fasting, narrow feeding windows for people that have really elevated blood sugar, high hemoglobin A1C and insulin resistance, and wider feeding windows for people that are more hypoglycemic and insulin sensitive. Because, you know, it's, 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 more often than not, and for some reason it seems to be more women than men, that will come into to our clinics and go, Gary, I don't get it. I wake up in the morning fasted. Um, I have a cup of black coffee. I go to Orange Theory for 55 minutes. I go hammer down. And I've been doing that five days a week for three months and I haven't lost a single pound. Like, what is going on? I'm not even eating. And I go, well, you're not eating, but your body is. It's just eating you. And so... Um, and so the three things that I've seen that have been really good for, for fatty acid metabolism, and, and especially in people that have stubborn weight loss issues, number one is um, getting the data on your glycemic profile, getting the data on whether or not you're insulin resistant, you're insulin sensitive, you have high average blood sugar or low average blood sugar. And that'll determine your, your feeding window. And secondly, um, for those people that work out in a fasted state, I have seen a dramatic improvement in their capacity to target fat rather than to just lose weight or or be stable by taking um, amino acids, like a perfect blend of, of the eight essential amino acids in a fasted state and working out in a fasted state, um, then taking protein powders and having to take all of that caloric intake in to get the amino acids. Because, you know, we, we often forget that when if you're if you're taking away protein, or, or even if you're eating a steak, or you're you're, you're eating eggs, um, you're taking in the whole protein. That whole protein is not what's turning into muscle. That whole protein is being broken down into amino acids, and eventually the amino acids are being sent up to the muscle to 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 rebuild muscle tissue. And we only think of amino acids as their contribution to building muscle, but amino acids are inside of every living cell in the human body it's how we build it's how we build our red blood cells it's how we build white blood cells natural killer cells are made out of amino acids um all of our connective tissue collagen is made out of amino acids i popped the link down below for create creatine gummies 50 percent off of them so after today's video check them out 50 percent off allulose sweetened gummies these have 1.5 grams of creatine per gummy so it makes it so you can low dose your creatine you're talking about getting in shape for summer, might make some sense. Helps preserve a little muscle mass by keeping your strength high, even if you're in a caloric deficit. There's countless bodies of research when it comes down to creatine. So I'm not blowing any smoke. The stuff is legit, but the little gummies make it easy to sort of microdose creatine throughout the day. So I find I don't get the water retention that I would get if I were to just drink like a five or 10 gram bolus of it at one sitting. Not to mention 50% off is pretty darn awesome. So that link is in the top line of the description underneath this video. 
Their new sour apple flavor, holy smokes, especially with no added sugar in it, off the charts. So, um, so two things I would say are secrets to um, fat loss. Number one is if you're if you're working out intensely in a fasted state, in my opinion, you you need to take a full spectrum amino acid supplement, something like a perfect amino. Um, if you have a, if you are low glycemic, um, then I think 30, 30, 30 is, you know, Tim Ferriss is 30, 30, 30. And we've seen dramatic um, fat loss in, in clients that we, that we put on a 30, 30, 30 program that ha that are otherwise hypoglycemic. And so once again, what does the 30, 30, 30 look like? 30 grams of protein okay. within 30 minutes of waking, okay. followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardio. Okay. In what time so, block? Um, so you're you're within 30 minutes of waking is when for you're- the, for, yeah, the, for the for protein, the, but what about- For the protein. So all within 30 minutes, in, including and, the cardio too? No, taking the protein within 30 minutes okay. of waking and then starting your um, exercise immediately thereafter. Immediately. Yeah. Got it. And, and, and you know, I've, I've read a lot of, um, you know, studies that you're still not that that protein is not making it into the blood yeah. for you know 30 to 60 minutes maybe 40 to 60 minutes anyway so i don't know that feeding immediately prior to or in this non-existent anabolic windows is, is, is making any difference you want the you want the amino acids to be available once the muscle is damaged to 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 repair to, to repair the muscle so people that are um hypoglycemic or have very sensitive insulin insulin or have low um, blood sugar because they're actually starting with low glucose and they're going to immediately get into their glycolic reserve, right? I mean, we know that the muscles um, retain glycogen and don't contribute it back to the to the body. The liver retains glycogen and does turn it back into sugar. So, so it actually throws it back into the bloodstream. One of the reasons why our blood sugar rises in the morning, even when we're not eating for, for people that start to wear uh, constant glucose monitors, sometimes that, that is like a little shocking to them that they wake up in the morning, the blood sugar starts to rise and they haven't eaten. Um, so 30, 30, 30 for, for we, we try to get data on, on, on patients always. I mean, we're, we're a data-driven organization. I'm a data-driven person. Um, so I believe that once you know what your glycemic profile is, um, are you working against insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, or are you working with sensitive insulin and possibly hypoglycemia or, or very, good blood sugar, in which case we found that Tim Ferriss is 30, 30, 30, 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking, immediately followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardiovascular exercise works extraordinarily well. I just did a, I just did a 30, 30, 30 challenge with about 50, 3,000 people or so at about 50, 53,000 people that participated in it. And, and the comments and the, um, and the changes that we saw over uh, six weeks were were pretty dramatic. And then there um, are those people that are insulin resistant, they're a little more hyperglycemic. And, and again, I'm trying to fit people into broad categories. Um, we put them on something called a perfect amino acid uh, by, uh, by Body Health, which was just the eight essential amino acids um, prior, prior to workout. And they worked out in a fasted state and had very similar results. So in this in this case, were the aminos serving as an anti-catabolic, or was there another effect that you were looking for with that as well? Well, I think they're anti-catabolic, and are, and and you know, when once the muscle is damaged, they're they're first of all they're anti-catabolic, so we're not burning lean muscle because we actually can you you can burn lean muscle during intense sure. exercise yeah. once you get through your glycolic reserve, especially if you start in a low glycemic state, and then you, um, in that that gluconeogenesis yeah. only lasts for a period of time, and now you're you're tapping your lean muscle almost like an accordion and you're, um, you know, you're burning lean muscle during the exercise and then slowly building lean muscle back and then burning it during exercise and building it back and burning it and building it back and not actually tapping our, our fat reserve, which is, you know, back to the example of the, you know, the woman that comes into the clinic and I'm just picking on ladies here for a second. It happens to men too. Um, that say I am working out very intensely in a fasted state, you know, maybe with just something like black coffee or pre-workout, um, and I've been doing this pretty consistently over a pretty prolonged period of time and I'm not losing weight. I'm not losing fat. And, and what most people mean when they want to lose weight, what they really mean is I want to lose fat. Yeah. Um, um, which, which brings you to the danger of things like Ozempic and, you know, semaglutide and tirzepatide and some of the, some of these uh, GLP-1 inhibitors, um, is that, you know, people are not just losing fat, they're losing lean body mass yeah. in a lot of cases.
Yeah, significantly. Uh, it's been definitely the, and they call it what, uh, Ozempic face, right? That's like, yeah, like, yeah, where it really starts to eat the, yeah, eat the mean, fat it's, and the it's, a, it's a real thing. Yeah, and, it's not, and, and onto the eyes, so the eyes really get sunken in because you really can't spot remove fat. So why I look the way I look. I'm pretty sunken in. <laughs> But, you don't look sunken to me, man. No, you look I mean, pretty healthy to me. I just, it's what happens when your face is lean. But I, 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 don't, I don't pick you as somebody that's on semaglutide or tirzepatide no, for sure. <laughs> that would probably be problematic. But yeah, it's, uh, I've noticed I've done a little bit of a pivot with you know my, my take on EAAs over the last like year or so too. Like I used to be pretty concerned with the insulin spike that would come along with uh, leucine, right? Mm -hmm. You know, But then the more that I kind of read and realized... First of all, I mean, you're talking, a, I mean, it's a significant insulin spike for what it is, but it's also an insulin spike that is countered by, by glucagon. So you're not really having this huge, it's not like you're having a rise in blood sugar that's mm -hmm. coming from amino acids, right? You're getting right. a we rise shouldn't have in a insulin rise in that's shuttling them into the muscle. That's the point of the insulin spike that goes along with leucine. Right. So I used to think it was kind of problematic for people that were, say, you know, fasting, being like, well, this would effectively break a fast. And then I kind of started thinking about it. And I'm like... You know, I tell people it's okay to have black coffee if they're fasting. If you want to get literal, that's breaking a fast too. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, I think if you ingest anything, you're not officially completely fasting, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you can't claim that like I am 100% water fasting, even if you have coffee, even though I think it's perfectly fine to have coffee when you're fasting. Right. So do I. <clears throat> and I used to think, uh, so I used to think, okay, well, if, you know, coffee's fine, but, uh, but aminos, maybe not. They started realizing, you know, actually, there's probably a benefit here. And uh, and so I have no vested interest with any amino company whatsoever, but I've noticed that I, I do get a little bit of an energy from it too. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like maybe there's something as far as a feedback system is concerned where your body's sensing leucine availability. So it's maybe a little bit more of a time of abundance so you can like push it a little mm -hmm. bit harder. Um, what's your take with fasted cardio or fasted workouts in general, if intensity is a little bit higher. So you mentioned like, you know, kind of easy cardio in a fasted state with some aminos. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on maybe increasing the intensity, doing some hit versus doing, uh, or, or even some resistance training or some Metcons, CrossFit style stuff. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that in our clinic setting, we have a huge meta-analysis of, of patients where we've, we've switched up the intensity of their training. But what I will tell you that we, we, we see in general, and this is based on large pools of anecdotal data. Mm -hmm. um, when when you're exercising intensely in a fasted state, it is more difficult to simply assume that you are targeting fatty acid metabolism. That all of that you're burning is 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 fat because some of what you're going to burn is lean muscle, yeah. and you know once you're once the amount of glucose in your blood doesn't go to zero, but once the amount of glu glucose gets in, in your blood to the point where your liver switches to gluconeogenesis, so it takes a stored glycogen and turns it back into glucose and starts to throw that back mm -hmm. into the blood, and then the muscles are burning the stored glycogen that's in the muscle, the question becomes, you know, what happens when you're at the end of that glycolic reserve? So you're you're exercising intensely over a prolonged period of time, and now your 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 glycogen st stores are depleted. You know, we'd love to think that there's just an immediate switch to fatty acid metabolism, that we just go right to burning fat, but that's actually not true. Um, we do burn some of our own lean muscle. And and it's we, we are adapted to burning lean muscle as, as a yeah. source of energy. It's a perfectly normal thing. It's not like, um, you know, the body doesn't actually prefer to burn fat. I mean, um, if, if, if you look at what the brain and, and most of our regulatory organs like the pituitary are concerned with, they're concerned with survival. Mm -hmm. They're not concerned with how fat or how skinny you are or how pretty your, your skin is or whether your hair texture is good. It's concerned with survival. And this is why when we try to outsmart some of these systems, like um, you know, one of the reasons why you never see one follow-up episode on The Biggest Loser is because almost without a single exception, those people not only gained all the weight that they lost back, but they ballooned to catastrophic new weights. Yeah. And why is that? It's because we tried to, you know, trick the pituitary. We tried to game the pituitary and say, well, we're going to put you into a prolonged, severe caloric deficit. And what happened? The pituitary adjusted the metabolism. It throttled back the metabolism mm -hmm. very significantly. You can see this when you look at um, thyroid lab work, you know, in prolonged caloric deficits, um, you will see that the thyroid drop or the, the pituitary drops a signaling hormone called TSH thyroid stimulating hormone and in reducing this um, TSH, 
TSH signal, you 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 reduce the T4 and the, and the T3 production, m- mainly T4 because most of the T3 is actually made outside of the thyroid, but it's deionized in the liver or the periphery, the, the the gut. But you will see a re- a, a reduction in in thyroid hormones corresponding to a slower metabolic rate, and so um, if you're I think it's fine to exercise in a fasted state, but from what we have seen in in large pools of of, of patients coming through our clinic setting, exercising for a prolonged period of time in a at a high intensity in a fasted state does not in, improve fat loss. Yeah, it does not. I think I would tend to agree. I don't think it is equating to more fat loss, right? right. I mean, it's, I think at that rate, it just comes down to okay, if you're and people forget that, I mean, working out at a moderate intensity compared to an intense intensity, it's not, and for 30 minutes, it's not a huge, huge difference in calories. I mean, it, it, there's a big difference in calories, let's put it that way, but it's not a giant dent in total calories for the day, right? So it's right. like if you train at a moderate intensity for 30 minutes and you burn 200 calories and you train at a high, higher intensity, maybe you'll burn 270 but that's not giving you a license to, you know, go eat more later, right? Because mm-hmm. it's you're going to quickly eclipse that 70 calories with right. Like that one, you, yeah. So, even though you feel like, you know, you earned that right? extra, and you might even, you know, I might even argue that the extra dip in 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 blood sugar um, causes potentially, you know, a, a greater distance for insulin to travel in there for a great greater hunger spike. Oh yeah, you know, oh, I think I think that's been. Uh, you know, demonstrated at least with ghrelin and whatnot. I mean, more mm-hmm. intense exercise. Uh, there's a brief period of time where appetite is blunted shortly thereafter, but then after that, it's a pretty aggressive rebound. I need and, to eat now. Yeah, it's and it and especially in someone that is metabolically damaged, that could be a, a huge problem because mm-hmm. then they're uh, then they have this impetus to eat so much, their system is broken and their ability to convert that into fuel appropriately right. is already broken. So thus begins the cycle of storing and, and lethargy and, and, and whatnot. And, and we know that, you know, when, when insulin is, uh, when our blood sugar is falling, we get, we get very hungry. Once our blood sugar is fall in, we usually are no longer yeah. hungry. I mean, that's that whole phenomenon about, you know, I arrived to the restaurant and, and I was so hungry, I ordered everything on the menu. And by the time the food came out, I was no longer hungry. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the the difference between blood sugar falling as you arrive mm-hmm. to the restaurant and blood sugar had fallen in by the time the food, food came out. Yeah. And so I, I, I think you're right. You, you look at the distance that insulin is traveling and that your blood sugar is traveling, mm-hmm. um, making your blood sugar, your insulin look like a heart monitor rather than looking like rolling hills. Yeah. Um, I think this has a tendency to have you overeat or at least battle those those cravings later in the day. Whereas um, using a um, a full spectrum amino acid supplement, I mean all eight amino acids in the right ratio, because remember if the, the eight essential amino acids, as you start to deplete, if, if you took three of those amino acids out and t- still took that amino acid supplement, dramatically different result yeah. in the amount that would be converted into sugar or fat. Yeah. Um, because once you don't have the essentials in the right ratio, the excess is going to be converted or stored as energy. It's either yeah. going to be converted into sugar or it's going to be stored as 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 fat. That's that's I think why the old BCAA theory went out the window, mm. you know, years ago because there was the big push to just take branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, and that two to one to one famous yeah. ratio. And we realized that even though those are being, you know, used at the muscle level, that that just taking the branch chain amino acids had, you know, dramatically reduced impact versus taking the full spectrum of essential aminos. There's some pretty interesting evidence with uh, taking essential amino acids alongside a protein meal as well Mm -hmm. and how it increases the the rate of like protein availability essentially. So I can't remember. I I, I, I would, I would believe in it. Yeah. And you're essentially, I mean, you're essentially a a BCAA guy, right? Definitely not a BCAA. Yeah. Yeah, No, I've made that pretty clear. Yeah. So it's uh, and I think most of the literature has made that pretty clear too. Right. But I mean, there's a lot of, uh, but it's almost like you fly off the shelves BCAAs. I mean, oh yeah, like, I used to pound them like crazy when I was, you know, trying to put on mass and you know, long, long time ago, like long before any of this stuff, right? So yeah. it's, uh, but I think it was just up a rope. I don't think it was really, you know, it might have placeboed yourself into something. Yeah, you placeboed yeah, yourself. For sure. But no, I think I think there's definitely, and I think there's merit to sipping on, you know, EAAs a little bit throughout the day here mm-hmm. and there. I mean, I don't know if it's something you want to have a continuous stream of constantly signaling. Uh, 
you know, leucine being like a, a pro-growth thing. You're constantly, mm -hmm. constantly, quote unquote, signaling pro-growth, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to sip on them throughout the day, but I have found there's some use, you know, in between maybe like a long gap between, say, lunch and dinner or something mm -hmm. like that, where I'm like, you know what, I'm not super hungry, but I could eat, but maybe, shoot, I could probably stand to have a little protein, but I don't really want to have a full meal or a protein shake right now. Like, I feel like that has some merit to it. Right. Um, and especially, I know I'm a little bit of a different category for a lot of people that might be watching that are looking for fat loss case. But for me, like if I'm going from 7% body fat and I'm trying to get down to maybe five for whatever mm -hmm. reason, for a shoot or for something in particular, being right. already lean, squeaking that last couple percent of fat loss, you're at a much higher risk of catabolizing, breaking down muscle when you're much leaner. No so doubt. EAAs have become more important to me now mm -hmm. as I try to stay as you know lean as I can year round because I'm like, okay, if I need to go add some extra cardio in, yeah, it might make more sense for me to be sipping on some aminos during this time. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if people want just a simple fix, adding in 35 minutes of steady state cardiovascular exercise with 15 milligrams of essential amino acids, the eight yeah. essential amino acids, run that for 30 days and recheck your BMI. I think you'd be shocked at how at at how much that's impacted your your fatty acid metabolism. And quickly, what's your what's your take on nutrient quality? versus calories you know i it's it's funny how uh, you know people are all over the place on this like yeah. um that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie and it really doesn't matter or the source of a calorie uh, you know i disagree with that because calorie calorie is really a measure of heat yeah. right it's the amount of roughly um the amount of heat that it takes to raise one cubic, cubic centimeter of water one degree centigrade so that so the so the caloric measurement is the same yeah. but the source of that you know it takes there are di different amounts of energy that are taken to turn different types of of foods into into energy so there's there is an expenditure there's a cost to actually pulling the energy out of that and there is plenty of evidence that says that the more nutrient dense the food um, the sooner we are satiated because the satiation response isn't necessarily just volume going into our stomach. It's a response by the brain to say we've gotten enough nutrients. I mean, why do people that eat high amounts of processed sugar or high amounts of processed foods have a tendency to binge eat or overeat even though they're eating the um, more calories, they are hungry more often. Well, a lot of it has to do with the, the, you know, the insulin spike and the insulin fall again, but it also has to do with the lack of nutrient density. And the less dense foods are nutrient wise, the more we continue to eat to try to get to the nutrients that yeah. we're, that we're missing. And you know, what's, what's sad is that, you know, we, we, we don't update the labels for, you know, um, from soil lineage studies to look at the nutrient density of, of certain foods. So if you sometimes if you flip over a, a pack of spinach, let's say, and it says that, um, and the macros have been updated. So then you look at the amount of um, fat or protein or carbohydrate or dietary fiber and sugars in there. That that data is current. The the nutrient density we have borrowed from decades old soil lineage studies. So we've imported that, and we it, and and we just because we don't have to update it. Um, we, we import that and we put it back on a spinach label and we say, well, a spinach leaf 40 years ago has the same amount of calcium, has the same amount of iron, has the same amount of yeah. magnesium as it did. And the soil is so depleted that very often that the, the nutrient content that's on that, those labels is entirely false. Um, the macros are not, but the nutrient density is entirely false. Well, even with the macros, I mean, there's like a 20% delta in terms of, uh, or, or variance, right? Like there can be a 20% margin of error on in, in just even the calories, right? Yeah. So it's, that's even if you are counting calories, like what you see on a label is not exactly, I mean, it's, if you have a, you know, 20% variance on a, or a margin of error, and you're talking a food that is predominantly fats, right? I mean, like that can be a pretty yeah, yeah. That's like a you start mat, big swing, especially big swing. over the course of you know x number of meals per day, x number of days per week, yeah. x number of weeks per month. I, I couldn't agree with you more. If you're eating, you know, five thousand calories a day, which uh, you know not a lot of people are doing that, but I mean that's that's a thousand extra or less calories, right? Mm -hmm. On either side of that. So if you're in 25, that's a 500, you know, probably most people, like you have to give yourself a margin of error of between five and 700 calories, yeah. even if you're looking at calories. And uh, the more that I'm, you know, doing what I'm doing now too, I'm starting to realize that, you know, I think that the nutrient quality piece is, 
I'd probably go on record and say that at this point, I think it's at least 50, 50, you know, meaning the nutrient density of the food and, and, and the thermodynamic part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, I think they, and they don't necessarily operate like linearly. And I think that it's probably a weird stepladder thing where in times of starvation, perhaps nutrient quality becomes more important mm -hmm. in times of abundance, maybe because there's always going to be these things like I, when there's going to be a demand that. and because you can't, it's one of the many functions of GLP-1 is to also kind of help regulate and find homeostasis for our glucose, but also regulate like when we need to stop eating. So you can't say GLP-1 is effective without acknowledging that like, okay, there's certain foods that increase GLP-1 so much more, right? Yeah. Like protein, right? So it's, there's not just a calorie discussion going on here if protein is going to you know, trigger this GLP-1 response that's going to ultimately tell your brain to start regulating, chill out on the appetite, you know, whatever. Even though the appetite suppression is sort of a, I call it almost an off-label use of the mm -hmm. GLP-1. I mean, GLP-1 is essentially is to bring us back to glucose homeostasis, but there's a lot of other pieces that are going on in terms of feedback loops with the brain with these, you know, some of the time. I, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, some of the worst science that, that we do on human beings is where we study things in isolation. Yeah. Right. I mean, we study one compound. So we take LDL cholesterol, for example, or, um, um, or, or glucose. And, um, and we look at cellular metabolism in a very myopic light, you know, or we take a cell out of the body, out of the community in which it exists. And we study it in a Petri dish or in vitro. And we say, because of this behavioral characteristic, if we put this cell back into the body, we assume that it's going to um, behave the same way. And I, 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 I like what you were just describing because I don't think anything is that linear. Yeah. Right. Like when people say the only way to lose fat is to do this. Um, you know, I, I, I find that to be very misleading because you know, like I said, we 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 use large pools of data um, to try to guide when we. Um, supplement large pools of patients with a, a certain supplement. We watch a biomarker um, stay the same or 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 adjust in the percentage that we have an adjustment in large pools of data. You know, you get some. You take an assumption, you and you validate it yeah. by looking at very large pools of data. But then you also have the outliers, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. and it happens in every measure of physiologic function that we try to that we try to track, even with large you know, pools of data. And obviously you can't do a experiment on people without, but we can say, well, when they go on this blend of, of, of B vitamins with this micronutrient versus this blend of B vitamins with this micronutrient, we see a much bigger correction in homocysteine. Mm -hmm. We see a much bigger correction in C-reactive protein. And, and yet you always have those outliers, which is why um, I've really tried to stop talking in absolutes. Yeah. Um, but like, if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, you know, what's what's the best way to burn fat? I would have just said 30, 30, 30. Yeah. But then, then it, I realized that that didn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it works for the vast majority of people, especially if they're starting at a baseline where they're just not even doing an exercise program. Sometimes you just need people to do something. Yep, it's better sure. than nothing. Like, what's the best way to burn fat? Just walk for 35 minutes yeah, if you're not totally. moving, right? And that will actually start your... Uh, th that'll start your fat loss journey. Um, then when you get to a competitive level, like, you know, like yourself and you're trying to go from 9% body fat to 7% body fat, well, that's a whole different animal. Yeah. Um, but for the majority of people, I think that exercising in a fasted state with um, taking the eight essential amino acids prior to exercise is a, is a phenomenal place to start. Um, and for, for the people that are, they have, you know, more, more, um, you know, faster blood sugar, you know, that are, that are more insulin sensitive and have lower blood sugars, 30, 30, 30 is a, you know, in a category would be a great place to start. Yeah, I agree. It's a good place to start for sure. Cause yeah. it's gonna, it's gonna fan out to a million different directions as soon as someone it starts. It is. Yeah. You know, and it's, and as more data comes out, like it gets, it gets more confusing. <laughs> yeah. And I think we can all probably agree. I mean, you and I, but probably people watching that if, if we had obesity and weight loss solved as far as it just being a matter of counting calories, I do think that more people would be losing weight. So no doubt. I'm not, and that's not a bag on calories and calories out. It's really not. It's more so underscoring the complexity of our human body, right? Yeah. It's it's not saying that, I do think that there are a large number of people with functioning metabolisms that could probably count calories and lose weight. 
Yeah. But I think there are a large number of people that, and call it satiety issues, call it uh, whatever you want, where they ultimately end up eating more in a sort of an unconscious fashion where mm -hmm. they just, they don't realize they're eating more, but they are. Um, and it's being driven by perhaps nutrient scarcity, perhaps all these other different things, hormones, mm -hmm. whatever. The bottom line is it's exceptionally complex. There's some people that'll say, we don't need to do any more weight loss studies. We have it figured out. There's other people that say, we don't need to do any more weight loss studies because we'll never figure it out. <laughs> um, so it's complex. So I think having these simple tools, like you mentioned, just concrete things that we mm -hmm. know make an impact. Look at your own data. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the best things, man. Well, that's the best thing. Where can everyone find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at Gary Brecca um, mm -hmm. or at the ultimate human .com or, um, you know, the ultimate human podcast, wherever you're listening to your podcast. Perfect. Right awesome, on. brother. Thanks, brother. Great one.